Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last OUSS talk of the term. I have the honor of welcoming Professor Christine Rollier, who will be talking about insights into the technologies behind the COVID-19 vaccine. Christine got her PhD at the University of Lyon, where she studied DNA immunization against hepatitis B. Afterwards, she went to work at the INSERM Institute, also in Lyon, where she specialized in vaccine development before moving to the Biomedical Primate in, uh, Research Center in the Netherlands, and then afterwards the Oxford Vaccine Group, where she is currently va working on COVID-19 vaccine development. If you have any questions for Christine during the talk, please ask them in the comments section below. Christine, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you. I will now hand over to you. Thank you. My pleasure to, to be presenting here uh, work that is actually not, not uh, done by my team. I work normally on bacterial vaccine development, uh, uh, but we, we are involved and I have quite some experience in, in the technology used. So, so that's why I show, chose to present that to you tonight. So my slides should yeah, come up now. So in the first uh, next slide, actually, what I wanted to show you was just a, a bit on an old table, but it shows uh, licensed viral and bacterial vaccines for use in human. And why I'm showing that table? Because you can see the typical vaccine development approach from vaccinologists. You first try your live attenuated vaccine, then your killed uh, inactivated for formulation or your subunit formulation. And in the subunit formulation, that means that you actually take a component of, of, the, of the pathogen target, which is either a protein or a sugar for the, in case of bacteria, typically plus an adjuvant. And, um, or actually the genetic sequence um, of, the, of the protein of interest when it's a protein. And one example is, is the adenovirus uh, vaccine licensed against Ebola. So you all know this type of vaccine, an example of a live attenuated is the measles, mumps, rubella. And an, an example of the killed inactivated is the inactivated polio virus. Example of the subunits that you all probably are aware is the hepatitis B or the uh, Neisseria meningitis uh, vaccines. And, and I've given you an example of the, of the genetic sequence. And it is particularly important for me to mention that one, the A26 Ebola, because that's one of the, of the technology used for uh, development of vaccines in COVID. So in the next slide, um, sorry, it's not me passing on the slide, so that's why I have to ask for the next slide. I just uh, took the figures from the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, tracker uh, uh, two, uh, three days ago, where well, you can see that we have uh, 13 vaccines in, in phase three, 17 in, in, in phase two, and some actually some of these phase two are uh, two, two slash three. And what I want to show you with that slide is that is exactly what I've just said, apart from the live attenuated vaccine, there's, there, there is none uh, for COVID in, in, in phase three. Actually, in the, the 10 of the phase three are these vaccine, uh, you know, following this vaccine development. You have inactivated vaccine, the Sinovac, the Barad Biotech of the Sinopharm. And you have the subunit vaccines using the genetic sequences. These are the mRNA vaccine for Moderna and Pfizer, the non-replicating viral vector, Oxford, for example, but also uh, the, the Russian vaccine, uh, Janssen and CanSino. And you also have the recombinant uh, protein adjuvant from Novavax. Another one that I will just mention is, belongs to exactly that same family of use, a subunit using the genetic sequence is a DNA vaccine, which is in phase two slash three from Inovio. And so I will focus on, on these ones uh, because the, the, these are the most advanced and they are grouped into one, one you know, technology, uh, which is the mRNA, the, the viral vector and the DNA with a focus on the viral vector. So in the next slide, this is the, the, the content of my, of my uh, talk, a little reminder of immunology, uh, quite an in-depth description of the Oxford vaccine. And, and then I'll finish on comparing with, uh, with uh, the mRNA and, and the very little uh, on the DNA. So the little reminder of immunology, uh, I, I didn't quite know, you, you know, what you wanted to know about that, but it's going to be quite brief in the next slide. So the immune system is, is composed, composed of, you know, in, it's a simplification, but you have the innate immune system, which is not antigen specific, and the adaptive immune, immune system, which develops and then declines with age and declines with age. And the innate is, 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 uh, is from birth. These two components actually uh, work together 
to mount the immune response, whether it's against the pathogen or whether it's against the vaccine. For the immune system, it makes no difference. Uh, what, what the immune system needs to see is something that is foreign, not, not uh, self, and also a danger signal. And then it will uh, decide to fight against it. And that's what I meant with these two uh, orange bubbles on the side. So in a vaccine, you will have a, a, the, the, a whole bug or a specific piece of the bug, as I mentioned, but you also need the danger signal. And the danger signal is typically uh, given by the adjuvant. And that is, uh, that is something uh, quite important because actually when you when you need you use this this uh, platform that I mentioned with using the sequence how do you bring up the danger signal normally you actually avoid the use of adjuvant and the genetic sequence brings a bit the danger signal in the next slide um, you can probably push all the buttons so that uh, all the next slide is seen this is a natural infection um, you Sorry, yeah, go on. So you have the pathogen that comes and binds and infects, for example, the mucosa, multiply, that's what you see on, on, on the right. And step three, there's a destruction of the tissue and that's the danger signal. You have actual destruction and inflammation. Immune cells uh, come to the infection site and then move to the lymph nodes uh, where you, you have adaptive uh, immune response. The innate immune uh, response also come up as a signal uh, to, to, to confirm the danger signal and push the immune system. And you raise uh, antibodies to control the infection, antibodies that can block the future infection, and also uh, a T cell potentially that can lyse infected cells. That's a different function than antibodies. And, and, in, and memory B cells in the best case scenario that uh, actually can then uh, be uh, used uh, upon the next encounter with the pathogen. And in the next slide, you will see exactly the same process uh, happens for, next slide, please. Uh, and you can see the same process happening with a live attenuated vaccine, for example, the typhoid fever. The bacteria is attenuated, you have a low-grade infection, and the danger signal is not severe, but it is still there to actually push your immune system to, to make the rest of the response. If you keep on going to the next slide, thank you, that's exactly the same as before. And you go to the next slide. Thank you. So, yeah, you went back. In the next slide, that's the case of actually a killed or component vaccine, for example, example DTAP. And in, in that case, there is no uh, replication, no infection, no danger signal. And that's typically why you will add the adjuvant. And the adjuvant will, will mimic, will, will stimulate the phagocytes to attract to, to, to the injection site. That's the stage three on this slide. There will be some pain, some inflammation, and uh, that pushes the immune system to react and make the response that I just described. So I think uh, all I want here, the take home message, is that if you don't have the danger signal, you don't have an immune response. And that's why vaccines have to have a danger signal. Uh, and it's a balance between having a good danger signal, but uh, a, a really safe vaccine at the same time. So this was uh, just my introduction, uh, my general vaccinology, immunology for vaccinology introduction. So now I'm going to go to, into um, uh, the vaccine developed by the, the Jenner Institute and the Oxford Vaccine Group against uh, COVID-19. So this uh, vaccine is a subunit vaccine because it only actually focuses on the spike protein of the of the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's just one one protein on on the outside of the virus, and it's inserted as a genetic sequence in an adenoviruses. What are adenoviruses? They are non-enveloped icosahedral viruses, linear double-stranded DNA. There's more than 100 serotypes existing all over the world, and they infect a wide uh, range of hosts, as I illustrated in, in that slide. The human serotypes, so in, infecting humans, mostly called mild disease in humans, that means uh, the, the cold and, and so conjunctivitis or, or, or mild gastroenteritis. But what we do, and that's in the next, next slide, for, for making them a vaccine platform, uh, is shown in that slide. Actually, you can see there that that green bar represents the, the genome of the adenovirus. And in pink, I've highlighted what, uh, the, what is called the early uh, protein. So when the virus infects a cell, let's say when you get a cold, the first protein that are uh, translated from that genome are the early protein in pink. And these are absolutely essential for the uh, translation of the uh, proteins in blue, the late protein, which are expressed after DNA replication. And so 
if you click on the next slide, what happens for using the adenovirus as a va vaccine platform is that we, we uh, genetically modify the genome by deleting two of the early protein, the E1 and the E3. Actually, you get away with only deleting E1, but uh, there's some reason why you also delete E3. So what the Jenner Institute had created, I think uh, a good, a good uh, eight years ago, is, um, uh, is, is this recombinant adenovirus genome where your E1 is deleted and it's so in, a replication in, in uh, replication deficient. The virus is able to infect a cell and it cannot produce any early protein and thus it cannot replicate, cannot produce the late protein, cannot produce new variants and cannot cause uh, a, a next infection. In the next slide, you can see how we can now use that genetically modified genome for creating a COVID-19 vaccine. So in this slide, you can see we have this recombinant uh, ad genome, one it's three deleted. And then what the Jenner Institute did is insert in the, in the space for the E1, insert the uh, genetic sequence for the spike protein. The production, uh, then th this, this uh, artificial genome is actually then uh, packaged through a cell line that provides the E1 protein in trans. So in that particular cell line, because there is the E1, the rest of the replication will go and the, in the cell line, you will have production of the full viral particles, um, which uh, are highlighted here on this slide as add antigen. When you immunize people, you infect actually the, the mammalian cell with that virus. And what happens is that there is expression of the foreign antigen because it's in the early space for early, uh, it's, it looks for the virus as the early protein. You have expression of the foreign antigen, induction of the immune response, and then the infection aborts. And so that's why this, this combines the advantage of an attenuated vaccine, because you have actually uh, an infection uh, that actually drive a T cell response with the safety of a subunit vaccine, because you have a replication deficient vector. You don't have a full blown in, in infection. I hope that's clear. In the next slides, for those who are interested more, uh, a bit more in, in the immunology, this is a slide just that showing how the vaccine works at inducing uh, T and B cell response. And I'm sorry because I can't, I, I don't have the, the the mouse control, so I can't really show you the slide. But basically, what happens is that you have that virus, this circle, injected into, well, infects the cell, and then you have these uh, two black arrows that shows one path towards um, uh, the right left. This is the path that actually doesn't exist when you use a protein vaccine. Vaccine. You actually don't have that uh, presentation, direct presentation by infected cells. And that is the path that is, is, is actually only happening during an infection and that drive T cell response. And that's specific from this um, uh, uh, vaccine platform new, using genetic material. And that's exactly the same process for an mRNA or a DNA vaccine. And then on the, on the bottom of the slides, you can see the, the, basically what I would call a bit the more the more conventional presentation, the antigen presenting cell sees the antigen, capture it, migrate to the neat nodes, and then uh, uh, drives uh, a B cell and potentially T cell responses. Okay, so that's the, the that's basically the, the, the mode of action of the adenoviral platform, so the CHADOX1 uh, in, in, in this particular case. So in the next slide, the, just uh, it's it's quite some text, but just to, to summarize the main features of the adenovirus vector vaccine platform, actually uh, now or it was the same slide before COVID, and the difference with the COVID trial is that there's thousands more people uh, in, in vaccinated and and, and a, a larger uh, safety profile known actually, so uh, it's safe because it's replication incompetent, as I explained. And even before COVID, we had safety in human trials for, for adenoviruses for something like 15 years or, or uh, for different serotypes. And there was actually also a safety in human trials from probably up to 10 trials with the CHADOX1 vector. And so there was already quite a strong knowledge about that, that particular um, vaccine platform and that particular vector that allowed the, the, the vaccine development to go a little bit faster than it would, would have been if it was a completely new uh, platform or a new uh, vector. And uh, at the time, just before COVID, there was probably 300 participants that had received CHADOX-1 vaccines against different diseases, thousands against 
other uh, with other vectors, and now it's thousands with COVID um, uh, nineteen vectors. The reactogenicity profile was known. We 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 knew that there would be some pain, some fever, from previous vac uh, previous uh, clinical trials. The adenovirus vectored vaccine platform is immunogenic. It induces, as I explained, antibodies and T cell response. The onset of immune response can be rapid. There, re there are some uh, studies indicating that single injection is possible. That's probably antigen dependent. Uh, and uh, also there was quite some research over the, over the last years to select antibody uh, adenovirus serotypes with low circulation in human populations so that there would be low prevalence of neutralizing antibodies against the virus itself. Hence the use of a chimpanzee serotype in the case of the Oxford one, the uh, one called Chadox one. And so, uh, I don't know if I can, and so um, I, I will come back to that in the later uh, slide. Uh, there is a suitable manufacture process. This uh, vaccine platform has been used for uh, developing new vaccines for several diseases, rabies, malaria, HIV, HCV, flu, RSV, Ebola tumors. Um, it's obviously been used for outbreak threats and pandemics. So the first one was Ebola, and that's where the uh, 26 Ebola vaccine is licensed. And, and nowadays, COVID-19. And when I mention COVID-19, there's not only the Chadox one vaccine from Oxford. As I mentioned, there's the Russian vaccine, a China, uh, one or two vaccines in China, and the Janssen vaccine as well. There's an established manufacturing process and actually at large scales, and that's thanks to the, the development as a COVID vaccine. Now we know that we can uh, manufacture at large, large scale. And uh, possibility for thermostable formulation. It's not included in the COVID-19, but, but there are a good amount of research in that area. But anyway, a storage is possible in the fridge, as you probably know from the news. So in the next slide, what I want to show yeah, next slide, please. What I want to show is what the, 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 the team from uh, Professor Lam at the Jenner Institute did for the Chadox 1 and COVID-19 uh, preclinical vaccine development. And actually, the, the figures from the, the all my coming slides are taken from the publication uh, from, from that team. So in this paper, what they did is a typical preclinical vaccine development for, for a new vaccine. They, uh, what you can do with that vector is have several designs that you can investigate because you you then produce a small scale production just for use in animals not not a gmp not for use in human and you test for immunogenicity starting from uh, uh, mice models so on this slide you can see uh, in mice you 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 give a, a single shot of uh, the vaccine and on the top um, graph are the antibody response and the bottom graph are the t-cell response in uh, red, you have responses in one strain of mice, the Balpsis, and in blue, in another, another strain of mice, CD1. This is uh, a really uh, a good, typical preclinical vaccine development approach. You test in two strains of mice. And what you can see, the vaccinated are circle and the controls are uh, square. And you can see that all vaccinated mice and, uh, raised antibody titers. That's the uh, figure 1A against the, the spike protein. Uh, divided into two subunits, S1 and S2. And figure B actually shows the neutralizing titers in, including in this, um, induced in these mice. And you can see that uh, the, the vaccinated mice had uh, uh, antibodies that can actually neutralize the virus or prevent it from uh, in entering cells and killing them. In the bottom section, you can see the T cell response induced, and you can see on figure C uh, that in the two strains of mice, one single injection of the vaccine induced T cell response, and the figure D indicates that that response is dominated by interferon gamma, which is a, a, what we call a Th1 type, which is actually what is uh, what you want actually to to fight uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. What they did next was uh, to try and have a, a measure of efficacy of, uh, of the vaccine. Having antibodies, raising antibodies and raising a T cell response doesn't mean that these antibodies are functional, meaning that they are good enough to block the infection. So what the team did is first that in vitro collateral of protection, the, the neutralizing titer in, in the figure B, but they also did a challenge study in an animal model. And on the next slide, you can see that study. It was an efficacy study in non-human primate. This slide shows the immunogenicity, so the raising of an antibody and T cell response in the, in the animals. And in red are the animals immunized with the uh, Chadox-1 and COV-19. And in blue, animals immunized with the control vaccine, which is a Chadox-1 
um, expressing a control um, antigen, which is uh, not related to, to NCOV-19. On these three graphs, which you can see on the left one is that the vaccinated uh, non-human primates uh, at uh, two weeks after the vaccination, so minus 14, which is minus 14 pre-challenge, but it's actually two weeks uh, post the vaccination, they all have antibodies against um, uh, COVID-19. On the uh, um, middle panel, you can see that these antibodies are actually neutralizing in the in vitro assay. They can neutralize the virus. And on the uh, right panel, what you can see is that there was also some T cell response induced in the non-human primate. The most important in that study is to see whether that prevents infection, and that's on the next slide. And this is the, the, the figure in that paper for the efficacy study. So again, the same color code. In red, you have the animals immunized with CHADOX1 and COP19, and in blue, you have animals immunized with the, uh, the control uh, virus. And what you can see immediately from all these graphs, basically these are different readouts of infection. And the take home message is that the animals get infected, but the infection is much lower in the animal that received the vaccine. So the vaccine does not induce uh, uh, sterilizing immunity. There is some infection, but it's, it's much lower, much more uh, shorter and controlled. It's not something that is abnormal. I mean, these non-human primates were challenged with a very high dose directly uh, by aerosol uh, on their face with a very high dose. And uh, it's, th that is something, for example, seen with the pertussis vaccine. You, you actually prevent the disease, but you, cannot, you do not prevent colonization and, and some replication in, in your nose. So this was as good as, as one uh, can expect, and, and we, uh, the, the team got the authorization to move to clinical trial. So in the next slide. In the next slide, yeah, I just want to, to have just that one slide on the, on, on the vaccine development and why it, it went so quick. So after you have your efficacy data in an animal model, normally what happens is that you make a right to ground application apply for money and that takes six months to a year and then you can start your your uh, phase one trial well your production gmp production and your phase one trial and why it went so rapidly for for, for covid is that um the, you know the money was not an issue people were you know the government etc there was quite some funders that was supporting that work as quickly as possible and also, uh, and the, the MHRA, the, the regulators, they really made themselves available at one day notice to, to, to study the, um, the uh, application package and give their feedback just the way they would do it normally. But normally we have one meeting uh, a month or another month and then we wait for their response and in, in, in that condition. So they just moved all extremely quickly. The other reason why you can go in, in a first in man uh, of the size that, that was done in, in Oxford is because the, plas the platform was very well known, as I explained. So, so that timing, uh, the, the top of that graph shows the normal timing, uh, you, you know, one step after the other. And actually in the outbreak uh, situation, the safety and dose selection was actually really, really quick uh, because there was all that, that knowledge about the platform more than 300 people already had received CHADOX-1. We knew it was safe. We actually knew it was immunogenic in human. There was thousands of people immunized with adeno or other type of, of chimpanzee serotype adeno with many antigen targets. There's even safety in infants. There was a malaria study uh, immunizing eight weeks, eight week old infants with an adenovirus vaccine, and it's absolutely safe there. So all that, all this knowledge actually contributes to to the application and and to the fact that it it is uh, uh, easier than with a new vaccine platform or quicker next slide so in the next slide i'm going to show you actually the uh, results in human and these are from two lancet paper the first one that was published in august will always be on the left side of the slide and the second one which actually shows the response in the elderly obviously very important in the case of covid 19 as, as uh, the higher death rate is in is, is in that population will be in the circ in in, uh, in the squares on on the right side, sorry, left side for the first paper, uh, right side for the um, uh, second paper. So next slide. 
first of all, local, local reaction. So it's a busy slide. I realize it's a busy slide, but actually the take-home message is really uh, simple. It's a shame I don't have the, the, the mouse, but what you can see on the left side of the uh, of, of the slide is the local reaction and the, the, the top the, the top line. So basically, what you have as local reaction, it's it's not too clear on on the screen. I don't know if you if you see it's too clear, but what you have where you have the yellow bar is basically uh, pain and tenderness at the at the site of uh, uh, injection in in the arm. And uh, here, the two uh, bottom lines are actually with the placebo. Right, and with the placebo, you have some some pain, but less than than with the vaccine, and that was expected. On the right side, actually, what you have here is uh, the the reaction after one dose in uh, healthy adults, and then the line just under it is in uh, uh, fifty uh, five. Um, uh, to 70 years old, and the line under it is over 70 year old. And you can see curiously that the older you get, the less pain you get. I'm not so sure what the mechanism is there, but that was good news, right? Next slide. These are exactly the same slide, only these are a systemic reaction. And what I wanted to uh, show in uh, this slide is uh, first the fatigue is the, the, the fatigue is the mo most uh, one of the most common, but you could uh, also have uh, some some headache or, or or some malaise, which is basically as I explained the danger signal from the vaccine. It's a bit more than the placebo, by the way. I forgot to mention the placebo is a, a meningitis. It's a meningitis, uh, meningitis um, vaccine. The reason for putting a vaccine as a placebo is uh, to keep people blinded. If you just give saline and there's no side effect, people uh, su suspect which group they are and, and, and the, the, the trial is, is double blinded. So really uh, some reactogenicity and it is expected and it was known from, from Chadox one vectors that it does cause that uh, no, no more, no less than, than, than we expected uh, here. On the right side, this is again the, the result on the top line from the healthy adults. And then when you go down the lines from older adults in the first three lines, and you can see that curiously uh, in the older adults, the reactogenicity, uh, the systemic reaction is also lower I I the older you get. Uh, which you could take as a, as, a, as a bad news. Maybe actually the danger signal is not as strong in the older adults and your immunogenicity is not going to be as strong. Well, actually, that was not the case. You'll see in the next slide. The last uh, slide I wanted to show uh, on the safety profile in the next slide. Next slide, please. Local reaction, first versus second dose. I think this is something uh, quite important. On the right side, on the, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my French. On the left side, uh, this is the, the top uh, slide is the first dose and then second dose in the healthy adults. And you can see very clearly that there is less reactogenicity after the second, uh, uh, at the second dose. And the bottom two lines actually are in the uh, elderly. Uh, no, the systemic reaction, first dose, second dose, same as local reaction you have a lower reaction after the second dose. And that's a bit unusual. Normally you have more reaction after a second, uh, a boost of a vaccine, second or third dose of a vaccine. And for example, on the right side, I've put the, the, the figure from the mRNA uh, uh, Moderna vaccine paper. And the, the, the first column is actually uh, after, after vaccination one, and the uh, second one is vaccination two. And you can see clearly an increase in, um, in the uh, reactogenicity, um, uh, local and systemic. The mechanism uh, of that, we have some, some ideas, but it's, it's not completely clear. So next slide. So now what you're probably all uh, uh, waiting for, you may, may have uh, read the papers already, is what, what is the immune response, right? So this, uh, this is a slide showing the antibody response uh, to the vaccine antigen, the spike. And uh, what these slides show basically on, on the left side, it shows that after one dose, uh, in in uh, red, you have a good antibody response, but you can actually increase it somewhat in the healthy adult with the second dose. Uh, the placebo are in blue here, and the and the, in green you can see actually convalescent sera, so people that had COVID, and that is their uh, antibody uh, response. In the in the box, you have uh, what is quite importantly the response in the elderly group. So I hope you can see these, these uh, graphs in the box very well, because in green, you have the healthy adults uh, 18 to 50, 55 years old. And the other colors are actually the, the 55 to 70 and over 70. And I hope you can see that the, the continuous line uh, actually pretty much overlap. And so it's very clearly that the immunogenicity is maintained in the older age group. 
The dotted line actually represents the group immunized with a single dose. And, and you can see that they mount a, a, a good response, but then it's not boosted by the second dose. So you actually end up to have a good titer, but not as high as when you, you have a boost. So two doses beneficial, is very clear, and the immunogenicity maintained in, in the older age group, uh, very good news. Next slide, please. And so, so I, I don't know uh, what question you're going to ask, but I'm preempting a question. Impact of pre-existing or a response to CHADOX1 or on the fact that you've induced a response to the vector. So I'm going to explain that concept. So that's a question we get a, a, a lot. There are different serotypes of adenovirus circulating in human population. And also, all different serotypes also used as vaccine platform. There's a serotype, human serotype 5, human serotype 26, chimpanzee serotype 63, chimpanzee serotypes OX1 and OX2, uh, uh, pan troglodyte, another chimpanzee serotype. What happens when you first encounter an adenovirus, whether it's an immunization or an infection, as, as I've drawn that cartoon on the, on the bottom left, is that you mount antibodies against the hexon and the fiber. So in, in, in the cartoon, these are the blue bits outside the virus and, and the fibers, the purple bits uh, are sticking out. So you mount these antibodies and they are here circulating just like if you've seen another vaccine or another infection. They, they, what will happen when you see the same serotype a second time is potentially your antibodies are good enough, they can block the adenovirus before it actually infects. So before it comes into uh, your cells, if it's uh, uh, an, another uh, adenovirus infection, but when it's a vaccine, it can do the same effect. It, it can actually block your vaccine, prevent its entry into the cell, and then your vaccine might be um, uh, lost, right? And so that has always been a concern with using adenovirus uh, vectors, is that you would induce that type of response and you would prevent uh, uh, the boosting effect. And I think I've sort of shown you already with the with the antibody slide just previously that that's not the case in or that doesn't seem to be the case with the Chadox one and Cov and Cov nineteen, and in the next slide you can see the actual data behind it. On the on the left slide on the le left graph you have um, the first the the first study the phase one where uh, people were either negative or positive for antibodies against Chadox one at baseline, and the the y-axis is actually the, re the the antibody response to the spike protein. You can see that, that there's no difference. There's no impact of these uh, antibodies against the vector uh, on on the the response to to the vaccine. And on the uh, right part of the slide in the square, that the same uh, the same readout in uh, uh, the, the phase two study in, in older adults, where you do mount an antibody response against the vector, but it does not correlate with the response. Whether you have a response or not, it does not uh, have any impact on, on the response to the COVID uh, antigen, to the spike antigen, T cell or antibody. So that was uh, quite surprising and very good news. This is unlike uh, a, a lot of studies that had been done in mice. Next slide. Uh, very important is the neutralizing antibody response against SARS-CoV-2. You know, there's this in vitro assay where you can measure the capacity of antibodies to actually block uh, the, the, the virus uh, entering into cells. It's like, like suppose, a correlate of protection. And again, uh, this is this, the, the data in, in the older population uh, overlapping the, the, the green uh, line, which is the, the healthy adult, the 18 to 55. And again, uh, the immunogenicity, the protection, well, suspect the correlate of protection is maintained in older age groups. In the next slide, I can see the time going so fast. Next slide, please. I want to compare to explain to you what is in the mRNA-based vaccine. I mean, you've probably all seen the news that the UK has, uh, government has approved, well, no, a regulator has approved uh, um, the use of the Pfizer vaccine, which is based on mRNA. There's a long history on working on, on mRNA since the 1983, where the recombinant RNA was, was uh, being produced for the first time. Uh, it's been used uh, for genetic transfer in mice in 1990, and then in 1994 uh, as self-replicating RNA vaccines already. There was a recent explosion of using RNA as a vaccine platform with two companies, so Moderna in, in the US in 2010 and CureVac in Germany, even earlier than that, that started to work on using RNA uh, as a vaccine platform. They received quite a good investment, but I want to mention academic, academic groups as well, and especially a group in London uh, led by Robin Chattock doing a fantastic uh, job as well on uh, mRNA vaccines. 
there's a key aspect around using RNA is that you have to stabilize and protect it. It's this very fragile molecule and you have to protect it uh, so that it, it's not destroyed before it's de delivered in, into, into the target cell. And that's probably what dragged, what made the RNA vaccine development much slower than using viral vectors because there was that hurdle to to to, to pass. And now that it's been it's it's been overcome, uh, the, the, the mRNA vaccine are really really exploding. In the next slide, the mode of action you have two types of of uh, RNA vaccine: the synthetic uh, RNA on on the left. You you just put the RNA into the cell. It, translates into the protein antigen and induces your immune response. The self-amplifying -ampli RNA actually has a signal to uh, amplify itself. So when, when you inject into a cell, it makes copies of itself, so more RNA, and so you have more protein produced, and, and so hopefully you have a better immune response. Uh, I, I cite some very good reviews for those who, who want to read about that. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the formulation is really key. You have to package the RNA to protect it. And also the package, uh, the packaging must uh, still allow the release into the cytoplasm. And so here is, is just a few drawings of different types of, of nanoparticles or formulation with lipid protection liposomes or, or to protect uh, the RNA. Next slide. Um, I already said that, uh, go, go on to the next slide. I think for the sake of time, I want to go to the result. In this slide, I just want to mention, this is only what my one slide mentioned in the DNA vaccine, which as I mentioned, is also in development for COVID-19 phase two slash three. DNA vaccines were uh, started to, to develop in the 1990s. Uh, immunogenicity in mice was fantastic. I worked actually on it during my, my PhD studies in 1995. Immunogenicity in animal model was fantastic. And it actually, when, when people try to, to, to progress this vaccine platform to human, uh, the immunogenicity was very uh, disappointing. But some people didn't give up and, and found ways of actually having more DNA delivered to, in, to the cells, inside the cells, and notably by using electroporation. And that's what uh, Innovio is doing. The difference with, between the DNA vaccine and the RNA vaccine is, is, is uh, pictured in this uh, cartoon. The plasmid DNA is delivered in the cell and then has to go into the nucleus, be translated, uh, um, uh, transcribed into an RNA, and that, that then is translating into the protein. On the contrary, the mRNA just goes into the cytoplasm, doesn't have to go to the nucleus, is, is translated directly in the protein. And I, I hope that's... Um, that's uh, uh, the clear difference, basically. Next slide. So uh, this is a slide showing a comparison of the of the platforms. This is a relatively recent, recent review prior to COVID, actually. So the viral vector vector vaccine they have advantages stimulate the innate immune response because they have this they, they look like a virus infection. They have all the uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns of a, of a viral infection and they induce T and B cell immune responses. The disadvantages that were thought to be, at least at the time, was the induction of anti-vector immunity. And I hope I actually highlight to you that that's not that clear. Uh, and the cell-based manufacturing, that is very true. You need the cells, I explained, the packaging cell line to actually produce your ve vector. And that is a bit more lengthy and, uh, than, than uh, producing the DNA or the RNA. It doesn't act, however, makes it more expensive, as, as you know, it's, it's actually a very, uh, uh, still a very cheap, uh, uh, relatively cheap production. The DNA vaccines, non-infection, uh, they still stimulate immune response. I mean, the, 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 you, you can also add some, some, some signal in the DNA to stimulate. Uh, no uh, cell-free production, st stable and rap rapid, but actually poor immunogenicity in human unless you use a high dose and electroporation. And the RNA vaccine, same advantage, non-infection, uh, non-infectious, non-integrating. They don't even go to the to don't don't even go to the nucleus or have to go there. And the concerns were was the instability and the low immunogenicity. And I think uh, the, the the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, trials and there are other uh, mRNA vaccine in development have shown that that has pretty much been solved, right? So next slide, I'm showing some data uh, from the New England jo uh, Journal of Medicine um, publication for the uh, Moderna vaccine. Next slide. This is the reactor dynasty. I've mentioned it already. It's pretty similar to, to a viral vector vaccine, except that the second dose is more uh, reactogenic than the first one. Next slide. 
this is the immunogenicity and what uh, you, you can see that different dosing they have very good responses and actually increasing in, in dose is not so necessary uh, they already have a good response with the, the 25 and the, uh, the 100 microgram and they don't have to go to 250 which actually was a, a lot more reactogenic in the in the figure D on the bottom uh, right, you have the uh, neutralizing titers, and they have uh, similar titers in, in comparison with convalescent, which are the the few uh, red dots uh, there. So very good responses with with two two doses here, very similar. And the next slide, really to conclude my 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 talk, this is uh, pretty much my last slide, is the efficacy in phase three trials, as you've all heard. So I can't really show scientific data here. These have been uh, released by press conference, uh, press release, sorry. But I've, I found that quite nice picture but made by the BBC, uh, trying to summarize uh, the, the data. So the, the Oxford vaccine, the Chadox one and COV-19, uh, 62 to 90% uh, efficacy. Uh, the Moderna, 95 the Pfizer 95, these are very, very good results. And the uh, Sputnik 5 from the, the Russian, which is an at 5 followed by, by at 26, also uh, 92. The storage has a bit of, of uh, differences here, as, as you know. Uh, the mRNA is still uh, needing uh, to be uh, frozen in uh, rather than fridge. And, and that's it, really. I think my last slide is just to mention the, the, the team at the uh, Jenner Institute and the Oxford Vaccine Group. So if you go to the la uh, last slide, I just actually actually here so that to avoid forgetting anyone, I, I just took the author list from these two papers. Uh, actually, there's this author list, the main authors, the, the main scientists involved in, in these studies. And then you have a list of something like 600 names in, in the attachment. And, and that's where my name is in, in, that, in, in, in that other list where... Um, it was a massive effort from from the two groups really and we all stopped working on what we normally work to to move to that and i hope i um conveyed the message in a in a clear fashion and i'm happy to take questions uh, thank you so much christine uh that was a really amazing talk that you gave us and it really gave a fantastic insight into the processes behind vaccine development and i think that final slide you show really like emphasized how much of a group effort all this research really is it's not just one single group there's just so there's so many people involved um so yeah we we do have some quite a few questions from the audience and i'll try and answer all of them if possible uh, try and ask all of them if possible so the first one is from valerie who asked uh how long does the immunity for the vaccine last i assume this is the covid the uh, oxford vaccine yeah. uh, so we ha we have data for for some adenovirus vaccines not necessarily the, the covid for example for the ebola where you you still have responses uh, a year after or even the second year after okay. uh, for that particular covid vaccine we don't know but that's where the the, the, gr the groups have designed their, their phase one and phase two study and, and phase three quite long normally when you do a first in man phase one you can do it in three or six months but here they they have done um, a one year so that people will be recalled one year later to, to, to check that response. And then you, you, you really, really clearly will see whether you, you should boost or, or not boost. The hope is that actually with two doses, um, I mean, I have my, my own uh, study with other targets, actually not, not published, but um, now you, you, you do hope for quite some persistence that that's uh, longer than a year, but of course you can't say until you have the data. Yeah, could you, could you sort of see a situation Feasibly, where people sort of get like a yearly COVID vaccine, the same way that uh, a lot of people tend to get a flu vaccine once a year, especially so, because it's so the reason COVID. the reason for the flu vaccine to to be once a year is actually because there's there's a, a genetic drift, there's there's yeah. modification in the flu, and you have to target the right uh, the the right uh, flu antigens, right? Uh -huh. uh, in in the COVID in the COVID situation, for the moment. The, the changes that have been seen are not enough to actually need another vaccine, right? right. Uh, so that's, there's two questions here, is whether your, your bug is changing or whether your vaccine-induced uh, uh, antibody response decreases. Even when your antibody response decreases, you may still have a lot of memory B cell responses that upon, uh, upon encounter, which could be infection, would be boosted and mount, uh, when it's a recall response, your immune response is, is boosted in five to, to seven days. So if your um, 
uh, incubation period is long enough in that in, in COVID it might be, you know, five days, seven days, mm -hmm. then even if you don't have antibodies, but you have the B cell responses, you can, you can, you don't need a boost. You would do your own boost mm -hmm. on your own. Okay. So you have really these two aspects, whether the virus is going to uh, mutate too much and then you need to actually uh, in change the insert, mm -hmm. produce again. It's a relatively easy thing to do for the RNA vaccine or the, or the Chadox vaccine. Um, this can be done, but in, we, for the, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is really how much antibodies or memory B cell response you have left. And that's that we don't know yet. Right. OK, that, that's pretty interesting. So I assume the COVID vaccine doesn't really mutate quite as as far as we can tell the, the not the COVID not vaccine. Yet, not yet. Not yet. But the reason why it doesn't yet is because there was no pressure. There's no vaccine yet. So there's no pressure for it to mutate. So when you come out with a vaccine and it, 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 it blocks, then the virus will try to, that's where the, the vaccine tries to, to escape more. It's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, so you might see vaccine escape when you use the vaccine at very large scale, and then you have to come up with another one. Right, I mean, okay. yeah, that, that's a possibility. Or it's mutating slowly. I mean, it's nothing like an HIV. That's that's for sure. So that's it's been. Yeah. There's many groups looking into that. So the few mutations actually for the moment don't make it escape from neutralization from the antibodies on on that one sequence. Well, thank you. Yeah, that it was a question that I was wondering about myself. So thank thank you for answering that so nicely. My uh, pleasure. And then uh, next question, if we can get that up. Okay, so this is from Volkorian. I'm very sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, is there any risk of developing autoimmune disease because the spike protein has 78.4% uh, homology to host epitopes? Okay, where does that data from come from? I, I was not aware of that. Uh, but even if it has, that would mean that infection would cause autoimmune disease. And, and maybe that's, I, I don't know if that's been seen by the pathologist, that's not been coming in the scientific news. So if if there is a risk of causing autoimmune disease by by being exposed to the spike protein, that would be induced during the infection mm -hmm. first. And, and then indeed, if that's the case, yes, that could be induced by a vaccine, but then any vaccine. But but again, again, that's would that would with the amount of people that already have been infected with COVID and mounted a response. If that was the case, I suppose we would start to see it. But yeah, if if there is homology, there's that's a risk. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess I mean I, autoimmune responses is one of those things that you see quite quickly though. And not in necessarily, I suppose. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, normally, yeah. normally, yes, I would, I would say yes, if you mount it, if it's vaccine induced, uh, I suppose, yeah, there is a temporal association that you would expect, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so but, then, then, but then my point is, it's not linked to the vaccine only, then the, the disease causes yeah. it as well. The presentation, the immune system doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it, if it sees the antigen, it will it'll react in the same yeah. way. It's the condition, potentially. It sees the antigen in your mucosal with a danger signal that is different and is that is manipulated by the vac by the COVID uh, virus, right, the mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2. In your vaccine, it's seen in a different... The danger signal is not the same. There's It's a little different. It's okay. not mucosal delivery. You can have differences, but... Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's pretty cool uh, to to learn about, not to not to experience. <laughs> um, and then, uh, if you can get the next question up, um, so this is from Adash who asks. Uh, th uh, this is quite a similar question asked actually. What is the potential correlation between mRNA vaccine and autoimmunity? If we deliver these mRNA vaccines, how hard will it be to identify those who are at an increased risk of autoimmune reactions? Such as lupus? Okay, so because he's mentioned lupus, I'm assuming that he doesn't mean autoimmune disease induced by the spike, but induced by the RNA and a response to the RNA. Um, yeah, it's an, that's, it, what, it's an, that's yeah. what I understood. I, I suppose yes. Uh, it's 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 an interesting question. Uh, I think because I'm not involved, I'm not an expert in developing mRNA vaccines myself. Um, these have been looked at by Moderna, uh, uh, BioNTech, CureVac. There has been quite so, quite a few clinical trials up to now. Admittedly, with a formulation that was not as immunogenic, and you can look for antibodies against uh, DNA, for example, for the DNA vaccine or mRNA. And I'm not under the impression that people found that this was induced. Um, uh, so anyway, if it was identifying them prior, that's a, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. For the moment, there's no safety signal in that direction. Uh, to, to to be fair. Yeah, that that sounds quite. That would sound quite difficult to catch. Uh, mm. 
compared to sort of the immune response caused by yeah. a spike protein or something that mm. we were talking about earlier. Mm. Okay, so I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Gotcha. Uh, one more, if possible. Uh, so, how much do you know about the molecular mechanism of your vaccine? For instance, does the gene carried by the viral vector enter the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm? Yes, it does. Uh, there's quite a lot known about uh, the molecular biology of Chadox, uh, well, of Chadox, of adenoviruses. They all work the same way. Um, there's a lot known. You, you, you actually know where the, 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 the genome goes. Uh, you know how much antigen is delivered, where, when it migrates to the lymph node. There's a lot known, actually. Okay. And that, yes, it doesn't go in the nucleus, but actually, if you what the question was, can it integrate? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have the machinery to to integrate into the into your genome. I mean, to integrate, you have to have a very specific machinery with a very specific signal and enzyme to actually make it integrate. It doesn't have that. Oh, okay. That's that's really that's okay, really. Yeah. <laughs> it was me interpreting the question, but no, I, just no, because no. I received that question quite a lot. I mean, you, you have to, yeah, you have to be probably virologist would understand what I mean or microbiologist. It's it's actually a very hard job to. You, you have to have the right signal and the right machinery. They have the, the, so the viruses that do that. They bring it with them so that you have that integration. It's it's yeah. not it's not in the ad uh, genome. Because I know uh, I think. People are probably asking this because I know influenza has a has its own mechanism, or maybe not influenza, but some other like some there are quite a few viruses. Uh, retroviruses actually, but yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no uh, that, not 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 the ad vaccine. Uh, yeah, I, I was just curious how so it, can't, it can't mutate or make a genetically modified humans. That's not possible. <laughs> I was just wondering how um, what techniques do you use to study the the molecular mechanism. Hmm, I've not been involved so much in that as a preclinical vaccine developer. So uh, what people would typically do is they put, uh, for example, a GFP protein in, in the, as the transgene, and then you can track the, your, your, your antigen, or you can uh, uh, do some labeling like, like, like that, or you actually immunize your mice, and then you take tissue at so many time points, and, and, and you put a tracker on, on, your, on your virus or your genome or your viral genome, et cetera, and you just track where it is, immunofluorescence, this sort of, uh, this sort of things. Um, uh, or even in vivo bioluminescence has been done actually you can even track in in the animal a uh, whole in vivo bioimaging where uh, where where it is it's it's not my my expertise but um that's a, um, i was just curious my my background's in biochemistry so i was just curious <laughs> so yeah i can probably send some links and papers looking at her there was a very good paper some some years ago where they compared the mva with the adeno with this sort of approach and actually compared how much antigen was produced and how quickly and you can you you have that you know massive burst of antigen uh, from one vector and the other is a bit less but a bit more over time and actually that is different for this uh, immune system is, is seen as a different sort of infection and then there is different reaction or different t cell response it's really fascinating that's it, that's but it. not all the adeno will do the same type of yeah. job, actually okay so i think we've got time for one last question yeah. if we could okay. get that up uh so this is from volkorian again um is there a risk that when the protein is expressed that the immune system will recognize it as a host protein and thus ignore the antigen and not develop the immunity? No, actually the recognition as self or non-self is actually done in the thymus. Uh, it starts before you're born and, and when you're a child. So that the, the selection of the self versus non-self and actually causing energy into your, uh, from your, your cells that's recognized self antigen is actually done uh, uh, too early for, for that. Um, I think what you probably want to allude in that question is can you cause tolerance and the, the answer is is no actually you don't cause tolerance from viruses infecting cells and being presenting by cells and this vaccine is exactly the same i mean you don't get tolerance to cold that would be nice but we don't <laughs> um yeah uh, i remember briefly studying or, or would be not nice because maybe then the cold would become massive and kill you i don't yeah. maybe it said something stupid there so so no your your uh, your antigen is foreign because the epitopes that are presented by the antigen um have not been selected in your thymus as a, a baby as self antigen yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. so the, the cells that can respond to, to, to it have, have not been deleted or uh, allergic. They actually are there and can react. And also you have the co-stimulation uh, signal induced by the danger signal. 
I, I always found it really cool how, in a way, your immune system almost trains trained just to complete on that actually and 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 tolerance is something different to to being seen as self you can induce tolerance with with some approach you know if you give a, a low dose of an antigen with no danger signal with certain routes that's how you induce tolerance it's different to mm -hmm. being recognized as self antigen it's just that you actually uh, train the immune system to to get um, uh, a different type of response which is actually a response shutting down the the active functional interferon gamma response to that antigen or, or, or IgE to that antigen. So that's inducing tolerance to an antigen is actually different to to um, to self uh, All right, okay. to recognize itself. It's not my area of expertise, so I hope I'm not saying anything stupid here. No, I'm, I'm I'm pretty I'm sure you're not. That's that was a really you can, you can really break hard. tolerance in in some ways, but you need specific co-stimulation signal so that you de-energize the, the, uh, the cells that were um, the regulatory cells, I think. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> but yeah, thank, you for, thank you for answering that so thoroughly. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, everyone. Thank you so much for the excellent talk, Christine, and Pleasure. for answering, the, answering all our questions. And, Thanks to everyone who has tuned in to our talks over the past eight weeks. We could have not have done this without your support. Join Luna Lee, our new president, next time for some more amazing talks and have a fantastic Christmas, everyone. See you next year. <laughs>